instructor, Allison Gottlieb, is visiting from Berkeley today. She'll be talking about her work on uh, children and psychology. She doesn't really need an introduction, and if you've been coming to FTS, you know I've got good introductions. Uh, but I'll just say one or two things uh, that one of the really exciting things about her work is that she did a lot of uh, public facing work. So she, if you uh, haven't seen this, she has a lot of motion journal, she has a TED Talk, she has a lot of stuff that's very accessible. And that's how I first was introduced to work through the book, The Philosophical Baby, which is recommended to me by a of friends. So it's really exciting to have her. She's won numerous awards, including a mentor award. She's a great person to talk to. That's how she's going to keep up with me. So welcome. Uh, postmenopausal grandmothers 
play a crucial role in enabling us to have these individual children. So um, remember I mentioned the interbirth intervals. It, the anthropologist Christian Fox has done a lot of work about this and has actually argued for what she calls the grandmother hypothesis of human cultural development, which is that it was actually those grandmothers who provided the nourishment that enabled, say, a two-year-old to survive, even though uh, the two-year-old's mother was had uh, another new baby in two years. There's another interesting thing about grandmothers and grandfathers, too. I just did my column in the journal about this this week, which is that uh, one of the things that's distinctive about human beings is that we're very cultural beings. So we depend a lot on cultural transmission from one generation to the next. And there's some interesting evidence that that extra 50 to 70 years that we have, again, compared to chimpanzees who died in their 50s um, as soon as their fertility is, is finished, um, that might actually be a period in which a lot of that cultural transmission takes place. So uh, if you look at forager societies in 50 to 70 year olds, and there are a lot of 50 to 70 year olds in forager society, um, they're not being as productive in the sense of actually producing food uh, compared to the village people. But when you look at things like who knows the stories of songs and information about the group, the 50 to 70 year olds and grandmothers and grandfathers are actually the ones who know that, and they spend a lot of time transmitting that information to, uh, to the children. So, um, and by the way, I mentioned orphans. Um, for a long time, when I would give this talk, I would sort of say, well, you know, we're the only ones who have grandmothers, postmenopausal females, except for orcas. Orcas, go figure why orcas? Um, it turns out that orcas are also one of the rare mammals that has cultural traditions. So not only are they intelligent, but they actually pass on cultural information about what kinds of things to use, for example, and what kinds of hunting techniques to use. And it's the grandmothers who are actually passing on that information to culture. Uh, so that's, again, a lot of adaptation short time, a lot of work, just to take care of these immature babies. Why would you see that? Why would you see that relationship? Um, well, it turns out that it's not just a just so story to think that this has something to do with our other properties, like our large brains, our capacities for learning, our capacity for culture. Because when you look across many, many different species and animals, you see this really striking relationship between the period of immaturity, how long the babies, how long it takes the babies to uh, mature, and things like brain size or intelligence, at least anthropomorphically considered from a human perspective, things like flexibility and learning. So if you look among primates, for example, there's a pretty clear relationship between how long a period of time it takes before they leave and how intelligent and sophisticated they are, how much they're involved in social learning. In fact, this relationship was originally noticed in, not even in primates, but in birds. So if you compare, for example, the bird on the right, that's the New Caledonian crow, and crows and corvids in general are very intelligent, and these New Caledonian crows have tool-using abilities that rival those of uh, primates, which you can see. Um, and you compare them to uh, the family of, that includes our friend, the domestic chicken, uh, the uh, chickens are basically, with apologies to any chicken lovers in the audience, which again is something I have to say when I'm giving a talk in the valley, because all the taking guys spend their spare time raising chickens. Um, <laughs> chickens are basically as dumb as stumps. So I imagine that actually people in this valley will appreciate that better than people <laughs> in the other valley down here who will appreciate this. Um, they're very, very good at grade. They're not very good at doing anything else. Um, uh, and the crow, the chickens are mature in about two weeks. Um, the crows, particularly the Calgary crows, are immature for as long as two years, which is a very long time in the life of the bird. And it's interesting if you actually see what's going on in that two years where the um, in that two years where the crows are fledgling. And basically, what happens is that the crows are screwing everything up. So what they're doing is trying to do things that fail. The owl birds, one of the amazing tool use uh, capacities that they have, is that what they'll actually do is they'll take a pandanus palm leaf and strip off the bottom uh, leaves, which leaves little bark hooks. They'll nibble the end to a sharp point. They'll take a inner piece at the back. They'll find a hole that has turbans in it. Um, they'll 
pump this thing into the hole. Then they'll stir it up so they'll agitate the turbines. And then they'll pull it out and they'll get the kind of turbine tissue up. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing thing that these animals are able to do. And in some ways, what's even more amazing is that they have to learn how to do it. So what the crows are doing in that two years is they're stripping the barbs off the wrong end, they're holding the thing by the pointy end instead, the blunt end, they're sticking it into holes and not actually have any termites on them. And all this time, the moms are sort of sitting there and tapping their feet and dropping termites into the mouths of these crows and writing their red checks. Um, and waiting for them to actually, waiting for them to actually figure it out. Um, and what that suggests is a relationship between, the, maybe the basis for this relationship is something about the relationship between learning and this period of nature. Um, and again, you can see this not only for birds and for primates, but you can see it across an incredibly wide range of different species. So for example, these are marsupials. This is a quokka, the world's cutest animal. Um, it lives on an island off of Australia. And uh, this is a Virginia opossum. And you can see the quokkas have paramounted uh, parents. They have one baby at a time, and the baby spends about a year inside the pouch. Um, if you compare that to the possums, the possums have multiple babies. The biological mother is the only one who takes care of them. And again, in a month or so, they're mature. Um, now, I think for human mothers, we often generally feel more like the possums in that picture than like the quokka. We can all use more backlighting in our lives, I think. Um, but of course, we're actually much more like the quokka than we are like the possum, um, because we have a much wider, much wider range of potential investment. And even though the quokkas and the possums are the same size, the quokka brains are twice as big as the possums. Uh, quite what the quokkas use those brains for is completely clear, because there's not very many of them who let them much about them, but they definitely have brains that are twice as big. And in one of my favorite recent papers, uh, Emily Snell Bird, who's an enrichment biologist, has this result that's even true with insects. So um, what she did was look at cabbage white butterflies, and it turns out that the life of a butterfly is essentially completely captured by the very hungry caterpillar. So if you've read the very hungry caterpillar, you can know everything you need to know about the life history of butterflies. So what butterflies do is they they flit around, they find a nice green leaf, they lay their egg on the nice green leaf, the egg hatches, and it eats everything that it possibly can eat, certainly the whole leaf, but if not, you know, sausages and cupcakes and all the things that the caterpillar eats. Um, and then it turns into a cocoon, and the butterfly comes out, and this process gets repeated. Um, so these are out of lay hundreds and hundreds of eggs, uh, only live for a couple of weeks, and yet, even among these cabbage whites, what Emily's never uh, and they're not, they're not, they're not swift even by insect standards compared to something like cockroaches who are really pretty smart. Um, a friend of mine who's a biologist claims that butterflies kind of get along just by being pretty, right? And they love them, but they're not really <laughs> there. The cockroaches are the ones that you should really, uh, you should really date rather than the butterflies. Um, uh, so what Snell Root did was she looked at genetic variants among the cabbage whites, and what she discovered was that some of them um, are designed so they just go to a very small range of green plants that are nutritious. So basically they eat kale, they go out to your garden and they mess up your kale. Um, but there are other genetic variants of cabbage whites that are able to go around explore different kinds of plants, find one that has high nutrient value, and actually lay their egg on the one that has high nutrient value, and then go back to say char to something that's a red plant, not a green plant, and find that, uh, that leaf to lay the egg on the next one. Um, and interestingly, those same ones that can find the red plants also will avoid a leaf that already has an egg on it, that already has a red So this is not rocket science. But if you're a cabbage white, there's a difference between this very hardwired set of behaviors and this other set of behaviors that's more plastic and possible learning. And it turns out the ones that rely on learning are have half as many eggs and are immature for twice as long as the ones that rely on the learning and the hardwired and the hardwired results. Uh, so what this suggests is that there's something very, very general and deep and profound about this relationship between immaturity and 
why would you see this relationship? And what I've been arguing over the last little while is that one way of thinking about this relationship is that it's an example of a very general contrast um, that you see in computer science, you see in neuroscience, you see in optimization theory, between the exploitation and the exploitation. Um, so the problem is that for many kinds of complicated multidimensional problems, the sort of problems that human beings try to solve, there's this intrinsic tension between two ways of trying to solve the problem. So imagine you've got a complicated multidimensional problem. You could think of it as being like a big box full of potential solutions to this problem. So think about this big box with a space of potential solutions. And you're at this point in the box right now. Um, how are you going to decide which solutions to try? You can't go through and try every single solution and see if it works. That would take your whole life. Um, so one thing that you could do is you could search. You could make small adjustments to what you already know. In other words, you could search in front of the space that are quite close to where you already are. And that's a kind of exploitation strategy. Because when you do that, you're likely to get a solution that's kind of good enough pretty quickly, um, something that will do pretty well. But of course, the disadvantage of that solution is that there might be some of that strategy, there might be some other solution that's actually much better, but much further away in the box, another solution that's much more different from what they're doing now. And if you just keep making these narrow changes, you'll miss that potential. So another thing you might have is this exploration strategy, where you look around for lots and lots of different possibilities, lots of different solutions. That is the advantage that you might find one that works, but of course it has the disadvantage that you're going to spend a lot of your time considering possibilities that aren't going to give any benefit in the short run at all. Um, and that's the basic exploration exploitation trade-off. Um, and a particular form that it takes is the example that I just gave. One way that people have tried to resolve this in things like machine learning is by contrasting the first kind of search. Think of it, think of that box of solutions like a box of molecules, air molecules. A low temperature search would be when you just are not moving around very much where you already are, or looking for things that are close to the solutions you already have. Or you can have a high temperature search where you're willing to bounce around the space, do a lot of random stuff that doesn't immediately make sense, try things that are very different from where you already are, um, uh, and, and use that as a kind of explore strategy. That's the high temperature search. So for Anyone here who has a three or four year old, um, which of those sounds like it's to you? It's pretty obvious that the bouncy, noisy, uh, the bouncy, noisy ones, the bouncy, noisy hot ones, and should be making messy ones sound like the three year olds. Um, and it turns out that actually one way of trying to resolve this tension between these two strategies is something called simulated annealing. And the idea is that you start out and make a high temperature. Um, and then you gradually cool off to a low temperature search. So here's a really simple example of this. You're just trying to find the highest point in this space. This is just a simple one-dimensional space. But you can see that if you just search close to where that red line already is, there's those two local minima next to you that are ready to track you. So if you look just to one side, you say, oh, no, that's not doing any better. You look to the other side, you say, oh, that's not doing any better. But there's that way over there that actually would be better and you're never going to reach it if you if you just stay in well if you just stay in the local search. So the way that, that gets resolved is you start out bouncing all over the space looking at lots of possibilities. But of course the disadvantage of that is if you're still bouncing around the space then you're also not going to settle on the right kind of solution. So you start out in this very high temperature broad search and then you gradually cool off so that you can actually settle on the right part. And this is called simulated annealing by analogy to what happens when you heat up a metal, for example, and then uh, cool it. That's a way of getting a more robust structure. Um, so essentially, my uh, hypothesis is that um, childhood is evolution's way of doing simulated annealing. So childhood is a way that you get an early protective period where you can do this kind of very complex exploratory kind of search without having to worry about the immediate consequences because your mom and your alamothers and your grandmother and your father are all there to take care of you. Um, and that enables you to reap the rewards of that strategy later on. And one of the interesting questions that we 
you've been thinking about is um, how much of this, some of this, you might just get in a kind of pure Bayesian way uh, just by learning more. So if you think about, again, that problem of well, when you have a wider search or a narrower search, if you start out not knowing very much, um, then you're sort of automatically going to have a wider, more active research. And as you learn more, then that's going to narrow the range of options that you should consider, right? So, you know, if you've got a lot of evidence that the solution is actually a pretty good one, then you should go with that solution and not be willing to shift to another one unless you have a lot of data. Um, so one possibility is that part of what's going on is just that there's this flatter prior knowledge. It's just partly that as you know more, you're going to explore less. But it may also be that there's something in the biological story suggests that there's something intrinsic to childhood, intrinsic to being a young teacher, that is giving you this wider search rather than uh, uh, something that intrinsically changes as you mature as you go. You see a picture that's very uh, uh, concordant with this if you look at neuroscience as well. So this is a famous graph from uh, Peter Patmarker, a uh, graph of the development of connections, synapses, development. You see very similar structures in animals and non-human creatures. And what's very characteristic to see is this early period when many, many, many new connections are being formed. And then there's a kind of tipping point where the connections are being formed and used a lot or myelinated, they become stronger, more efficient, more long distance. And then the ones that aren't used are perfect. Yeah. And you can see that tipping point is in different parts of the uh, brain for different kinds of areas. But the prefrontal area is particularly interesting because that's kind of the control area, the executive area of the brain that's the part that influences, inhibits, focuses uh, other parts of the brain. And that's actually the last part of the brain to mature. And there's long distance connections between that part of the brain and the rest of the brain related to And very often this is seen as if it's just a kind of you know problem that we need to develop this. Uh, this frontal lobe that's going to be uh, controlling what we do. But actually, if you're thinking about this explorers of trade off, it actually makes sense to have a young brain that's really well designed to be plastic, to learn a lot, to extract information from the environment. And then this later brain that's much more efficient and active, but not as good at being flexible. Yeah. And there's, that seems to be the neuroscience for me too. And in fact, there's some evidence that um, for neuroscience that having less control, although it has lots of disadvantages in terms of action, actually leads to more exploration. So from this perspective, if you're thinking about children as these exploratory researchers, things that we often think of as bones of childhood may actually be features. So things like the fact that children are random, they're noisy, the things they do are very variable, there's much more variance in the behavior than those for adults, the fact that they have these executive function deficits, that they play. And again, something that we all take for granted is across the animal kingdom, young animals play and old animals don't. But you know, there's no reason why that would be necessarily true. And in a way, the definition of play is play is exploration without exploitation. The whole point about what, what makes something playful is that it doesn't give you uh, uh, exploitation benefits in the short run. Um, and then, characteristically, we're starting to do this. You see more curiosity, more of what's called neophilia, but in the evolutionary uh, world, in young animals than in old animals. So there seems to be a kind of affective and motivational system that changes over the development that fits this exploring versus exploring. First exploring and um, So has this fit in with the kind of empirical work that I and other company developmental have been doing? Well, for the past 15, 20 years, um, I've been working on something that I think of as the Theory Theory 2.0. Uh, back in the 80s, I and other development psychologists argued that children's learning was like intuitive theory formation. You can think about children as doing something similar to what scientists were doing. My first popular book was actually called The Scientist in the Career. Uh, what we've been doing more recently is hashing this idea out more precisely by thinking about children's learning as being a matter of uh, learning these generative probabilistic Bayesian models, abstract representation to the world theories from patterns of statistical data that you see out there. And 
through multiple computer science, we've been able to make this idea much more precise about exactly how children are constructed from institutions. Um, and the essential kind of basic idea is that, again, go back to that big box full of um, um, solutions. Now think about that big box as being full of hypotheses about how the world works with your assumptions. So here's all the hypotheses you can have about how some system will work. Works. And what the, I'm not going to go into Bayesian inference, but essentially what the Bayesian approach lets you do is to take all those hypotheses, take a pattern of data, and say, given this pattern of data, what's the probability of each one of these hypotheses? And then you can pick the you know, more likely rather than the less likely hypotheses. And you can have a formal mathematical way of doing So that looks like that's pretty good. That's a way that you can actually learn the structure of the data. But it has a big catch. And the big catch is, again, this is still a exploit problem. How do you decide which hypothesis to test? You can't go through and test every single possible hypothesis and hypothesis against the data and calculate its problem. So how do you search through this space of uh, possibilities? And work that my colleagues and I have been doing more recently has suggested um, what we call the sampling hypothesis. Um, and again, I won't go into details about this, but in machine learning and computer science, one way that you solve this problem is by systematically sampling, systematically, though systematically but randomly picking out potential hypotheses and testing them. And there's principles we have about how to randomly pick out hypotheses. And we've got some evidence that even when children think of something that's similar to um, But again, if you think about that sampling process, it again raises this exploring versus exploring question. How broadly should you sample? What temperature should you sample? And the work that we've done more recently, what we've discovered is that, um, and we discovered this kind of fortuitously to begin with, particularly when you're trying to learn really abstract hypotheses, what we discovered was that younger learners actually seem to be searching the space more broadly than older learners. And let me give you an example of this, or I'm talking about. Bayesian inference of causal hypotheses and statistical data. Anyone who's taught or taken a statistics course knows that adults are really terrible at doing any of this stuff. So how on earth could we be showing that three-year-olds are doing it? Um, well, the way we've done that is with this little handy device, the lipid detector. It's a box that lights up and, you, and plays music when you put some things on it and not other things. And what we can do is we can show kids patterns of data with this simple toy and other simple toys that we've designed. And then we can just say, make this go. And if you've understood the causal structure, then you should make the right inference about how to make it go. And if you haven't, you won't be able to figure out how to make it go. So we don't ask about dependent probability or uh, hypotheses or any of those kinds of things. We just show you a bunch of stuff and then say, now make the machine. Um, let me give you an example of this. Um, Here's my blanket detector, and here's two different blankets that are going to go on the detector, D and e, F. D goes on the detector three times, nothing happens. E goes on, nothing happens. D and F together go on twice, the machine lights up. And the question, you guys can all be participants in this experiment. Um, the question is, is D a blanket? Okay. Okay. Is E a blanket? Okay. Is F a blanket? Okay, great. So as I thought, the students at Merced are as smart as the students at Berkeley, but possibly not as smart as four-year-olds. Because what if you also saw this sequence of events? So you saw that A, B, and C don't make the detector go. A and B together don't. B and C don't get enough, but A and C together do. Now you might think, oh, wait a minute. I thought the way this detector worked was that Either something made it go or it didn't make it go. And it turns out this detector works in this really weird, unusual way where you actually have to put combinations of blocks on to make it go. The individual blocks don't come the power. And if you saw this sequence first and then you came back to this sequence, you might think, oh, wait a minute, if this is one of those weird combination detectors, then D and F probably are both blocks, if, that, if that's the way this system so what we did was we just did exactly what I just did with you, um, but with um, Berkeley undergraduates and four-year-olds. 
And we either gave them training that the individual uh, blob rule was the right one, or we gave them training that the combination rule, abstract rule, was the right one. Um, and then we just gave them the same ambiguous test that we gave them. And here's what this looks like. So very importantly, next time we figure out which of these are limits. So let's call this one try. Okay? What should we call this one? Square. Square. And what should we call this one? Ball. Ball. Sounds good. Okay, so let's see what happens when we put triangle on the machinery, right? Let's see. Look at that. The machine did not turn on. Let's see what happens when we put triangle on the machine now, okay? Look, the machine did not turn on. Now let's see what happens when we put triangle on the machine one more time, okay? Let's see. Look, the machine did not turn on. Now let's see what happens when we put square on the machine, okay? Look at that. The machine did not turn on. Okay. Now let's see what happens when we put triangle and ball on the machine together. Look at that. The machine turned on. Now let's see what happens when we put triangle, square, and ball all on the machine together. Are you ready? Let's see. changes. 
organs might be causing the change. And here's uh, another way of showing the same data. So you can see that you don't see this pattern in the same way uh, in the case where you've got evidence from the likely hypothesis. So when you have evidence from the likely hypothesis, there is some evidence that as you're accumulating experience, you're gradually less likely to go with the, um, uh, the combination hypothesis. Um, but it's really different from the case with the unlikely hypothesis, when you see this, you see this uh, much more nonlinear kind of function. And you see the same thing with, um, uh, and notice by the way that for all the age groups, the baseline, when you get no evidence at all, actually looks quite a bit like the evidence for the likely hypothesis, which suggests that even the little kids, sort of their prior is assuming that it's the individual objects. The difference seems to be that they're more going to shift given that they've got additional data. Um, and here's the same thing. Um, looking at the intervention, looking at where you put two objects on the machine, which is one object on the machine. So it's just something about what we're looking at. Um, we wanted to see, is this just weird? Um, as they said, is this just something about Western, educated, industrial, rich, democratic adults? Um, so what we did was we did the same thing in, uh, essentially, favelas in Peru. So these are places outside of the outskirts of Peru where uh, there's generation, new generation immigrants just coming in from uh, the countryside, um, and they're starting to go to school and learn. Um, and we also did this with Head Start kids in Oakland. And what we discovered was that um, both the Peruvian kids and the Head Start kids looked like the UC Berkeley kids. So in fact, somewhat to our surprise, the Peruvian kids were the most flexible of any kids that we tested, although in retrospect, we should have we should have realized this given the kind of lives that these kids were living. Um, they actually get to explore more than our middle class kids, and they have a very wide network of people to take care of. Um, but there's certainly, this seems to be something that's really pretty foundational. It's not just something about what happens when you're in a highly educated culture. Um, and we found a whole bunch of other examples where younger learners are actually more exploratory than. Um, than adults, and you can kind of look around in the literature. Um, for instance, we did a task that was a social task, rather right? than a physical causation task. A task about whether you think that people do things because of their long lasting personality traits or because of the situations they find themselves in. And one thing that we know about adults from social psychology, at least Western adults, is that they have a very strong bias to explain people's actions in terms of their traits, even when the data doesn't. So when they were the torturers of Eric Abu Gray, the first thing that people in the West said was, well, those individual people were sadistic or crazy or something like that. And it turns out that actually most people put in this kind of stressful situation became really bad. Uh, uh, so what we did was just do that experiment with four-year-olds and adults, and what we discovered was the adults, just as we expect, showed this bias even with the game of data. The four-year-olds would not show bias. They would go with the right experiment. But the interesting thing in this case was that the adolescents were actually the most flexible. So in this, remember the adolescents were inflexible in the physical case, in the social case, they actually were more flexible than either the school kids or the adults, which might suggest it's consistent with the idea that adolescents might be this other degree of plasticity. Um, and then there are examples, other examples, relational concepts, foreign languages, a number of other uh, examples that we've done in their language. So let me give you the last example of an experiment that still, we're still in, uh, we're still doing, and we're still in the course of doing. I'm trying to see, could we actually find differences in this exploration versus the exploitation trade-off over development specifically? This is what we're doing. And what Emily very cleverly did was to take a paradigm that's in the animal literature, where now instead of it just being a blicky detector that lights up, it actually has constant. So if you get that red uh, uh, outcome, then you actually lose two stickers. But if you get any of the other outcomes, the green outcomes, then you actually get a sticker. So now there's a really explicit reward associated with what the detector does. And what uh, uh, people who work with adults have discovered, and the other thing that's different is now you get to, sorry, you get to choose 
which um, you get to choose which um, blobs you can put on the machine. So there's a bunch of a bunch of blobs. One goes on. You choose one at a time to put it on the machine, and depending on what happens, you either lose your gains. So there's an interesting tension here between what you should do to try to get as many stickers as possible, and what you should do to try to get as much information as possible. And what people have found with adults is you can see the labels. Do people hear me? You can see the way this works is that, see that yellow scraped block is the one that is leading to the negative reward. Um, and what happens is with adults, when they see that, then they'll avoid anything that has stripes and anything that's yellow. Right? So they don't really don't want to be lose the stickers between this on MTurk with actually money, and even though it's like you know five cents, people still don't want to lose their money. So then they refuse to try anything that has is either yellow or striped. But as you can see, if you do that, you're not actually going to get the right rule because it turns out that the rule is actually uh, uh, that it has to be yellow and a stripe to have the name. And you're not going to learn that rule if you, if you never test anything that is uh, yellow and stripe. I'm sorry, yellow or stripe. So you can never test anything. So what we did is we just did that same experiment um, with four year olds and six year olds and adults. And what we discovered was that, again, this will not surprise anybody who has a four year old. Four-year-olds were perfectly happy to try things that would lead to the bad outcome. They didn't see it. They, and again, I like this because this is one of those bug versus features cases, right? Where if you just saw this result, you'd say, oh, see how stupid and incompetent four-year-olds are. They're going ahead and putting this thing on that's going to make them these stickers. Um, but, and the six-year-olds were less likely to do that, and the adults were less likely to do that. But the result was that the Four-year-olds were actually learning the right rule to the adults one. So the four-year-olds were actually learning this two-dimensional rule, getting more information than the adults one. So the four-year-olds were really seeing to have a different exploration and exploitation balance than um, the adults. And we're doing a bunch of other things. Okay, let me end with something completely different. Um, something that we're just, just, so this is, you know, the thing that's impressed. This, this is something that we're just starting to um, is there a way that we could actually um, have an adult brain that was functioning like uh, that was functioning like the childhood brain? Um, let me tell you a story that I like to give as an example of kids doing a broad but sensible search. One of the great things about being a developmental psychologist is that you can get to tell cute stories about your grandchildren and no one can stop you. <laughs> so here's a cute story about my brilliant grandson, Aki. His father actually asked that question I just asked. He said to Augie, do you think, well, I would really like to be a king, and I wish I could be a king. And Augie thought about this for a while and said, Grandpa, maybe you could try, don't eat any broccoli, and don't eat any green beans, and don't eat any healthy food, and then maybe you could go back to being a king. And obviously, the thought process was, everybody tells me that if you eat all this healthy food, you grow up to be weak, strong adults. So if you don't eat any of it, then you can go from being a big, strong adult back to being <laughs> And I like this as an example of his coming up with hypothesis that's obviously way out of the space compared to the adult space, but isn't completely random and crazy. He actually has some logic to it, and that's the kind of thing that I think three-year-olds are doing. Um, so rather than not eating any broccoli, I think there is a way that you could put the brain back into its childhood state. Um, and here's the way to do it. So there's been a bunch of recent work looking at the effects of psychochemicals like LSD and psilocybin depending on, uh, on the brain. And to a remarkable degree, to a degree that I would never have predicted, what you see is that those chemicals have the effect of reverting the brain back to something that looks much more like its childhood state. Um, so that, this, that first graph is, remember when I was showing you the graph of synaptic development, that shows you, you know, at birth there's a few synaptic connections, then at seven there's lots, and then there's this primitive process. This is from a paper that just came out of a cell, and that's the cell not on LSD, and that's the cell on LSD. 
So essentially what's happening is that this whole, it's interesting, these, these substances are very different from one another uh, chemically, but all the ones that have psychedelic phenomenological effects seem to have this effect of increasing the plasticity. And Robert Carr Harris has also done this, as well as turning it tidal, as you can see in this picture, has shown that not only is there, so not only is there this greater this increase in plasticity, but you also see deactivation of these frontal control networks that I was talking about, that are the things that become activated in the course of development. Um, and you also see more local connection and less long distance connection. So that's your brain on some side, but you can see there's much more local, there's much more local uh, connection possibilities and then disruption. And if you think about the, um, if you think about the cognitive effects of psychedelics, they also, in many important respects, mirror the psychedelic the effects of, of childhood. So you see this disruption of ego in the sense of the self, which is something that we know is developing across childhood. You see less higher order reflection. Uh, obviously, executive function gets really uh, messed up uh, under these uh, under these cases. You get more imagination and you get more vivid imaginative phenomenology uh, uh, and you get less tough to control. In the imagination case, I think, is really interesting. Um, uh, Carol was saying she read The Philosophical Baby, and in The Philosophical Baby, I had a couple of chapters where I tried to answer the question, what's it like to be a baby? Uh, or is it? Uh, which is an interesting question. What's the consciousness? What's the phenomenology like the material? And one of the paradoxes of developmental psychologists talked about for a long time is that um, children have this very vivid imagination. So they have imaginary friends and they'll insist that you set a place for imaginary friends and they'll be terrified of the monster in the closet. We've all kind of had that experience with three-year-olds. But there's a whole lot of recent work which shows that three-year-olds understand perfectly well that those things are imaginary, they're not real. Um, they'll tell you that their imaginary friend is just imaginary and not real. So why What's the phenomenology that's leading them to have these really vivid, act as if they're really vividly experiencing these things? And I think that's exactly the phenomenology that you see on the psychedelic experience. So unlike other conditions like schizophrenia, people under psychedelics don't really hallucinate in the sense of genuinely believing that the things that you're seeing are there. The phenomenology is, I'm having a very vivid experience of this thing that I'm thinking about, even though I know perfectly well that it's not actually something. I think it might be an interesting way of thinking about both the nature of the psychedelic experience and the nature of something like a country. And on top of that, um, there are these computational effects. So there's more and more uh, models of the computational effects of psychedelics in some of these recent neuroscience work. And the kind of prevailing um, computational theory about what psychedelics are doing is that essentially what they're doing is loosening this kind of top-down control. Um, so they're flattening your prior for you um, in a way that kids automatically have a flat prior or less uh, top-down control. Um, and the predominant theory of the reason why they have the therapeutic effects that they have, and there's more and more evidence that they do have really remarkable, remarkably robust therapeutic effects, is that they do it by restoring plasticity. So especially for disorders like depression and anxiety that seem to have this quality of narrowing the range of things that people are going to think. The therapeutic effects seem to be opening up this wider range so that then when you become an adult again after the uh, psychedelic experience you can you can um, consider alternatives. Okay, so let me end with some open questions. Um, how much of this is about uh, a kind of reward that's different from the kind of reward that uh, that adults have? Are children being rewarded for explanation or for curiosity to have a different kind of reward system? How much of this is uh, just randomness versus strategy? So I like the lucky example about the, um, about not eating broccoli. It's not that the kids are completely random, but they're doing things that seem to be sort of relevant to the whole part. But it's a really important question that people in neuroscience have talked about this about how much can you get resolved as exploit exploitation by 
just doing a lot of random, noisy, weird stuff versus sitting there and saying, ha, I have to explore to solve this problem. What's the best way of using my resources to actually explore to solve this problem? And those are really different kinds of strategies. And I think it's a really interesting question about for kids, for adults, for people at psychedelics, how much of each one of those things is, is happening. And as I said, there's this still general question about what's the relationship between priors and experience and accumulation of knowledge and the changes in Changes in search. Um, and let me end by uh, thanking um, all the graduate students who, of course, are the explorers who enable me to get out of my local minima and then to thank the funding agencies that are actually the owl parents that managed to provide a nurture and environment in which all of us scientists can explore. And I'll end there. And there's bits 
of evidence that you know some of these kind of bugs as features that you get uh, on some kinds of dimensions could be made that you could actually do better in a lot of these kind of global integration uh, kinds of dimensions. Yeah. 
So, uh, one quick question, one quick comment. Uh, with regards to the question, uh, you introduced the idea of psychedelics being the way uh, you can sort of get into the more exploratory mode. Uh, but at least with the research, and I think this came up during the lunch, uh, those results seem to be positive or mostly positive in environments where there's uh, somebody to guide you. Yeah. Like some sort of uh, therapist of some sort. And connecting that to the beginning of the talk where you introduced the idea of grandmothers, uh, what is it, being cultural influencers in the rearing of children, is it the case that in both these situations, what they're kind of doing is providing more narrow space for an individual to perform this sort of what you call simulated healing? Right. Uh, yeah, so I think that's a really interesting question. So there is at least a little bit of evidence in the evolutionary literature that um, the nurturance actually is necessary to have this period, the, the sense of protective nurturance and stability is necessary for them to have the exploration. So there's some evidence that children, for instance, who are in very high stress situations early on in life are going to mature, I mean, even physically mature quickly than children who have uh, more nurturing, resourceful environment. And it's interesting because that was part of the reason why we did the Head Start in Peru study was we thought, well, maybe those kids will look more like the adults more quickly. <coughs> but, you know, those are kids who have parents who really are, you know, getting them into schools, getting them into Head Start programs. So, they're, they're, they actually do have a lot of nurturing, um, uh, a lot of nurturing background. Um, but I think it's a really interesting question about what's the balance between having a kind of structured, predictable, reliable, nurturing environment and then having enough variabilities so that you can explore. And, and you know, part of the thought that you might have is that one of the things that the caregivers are doing is, and there's some evidence that this is kind of gradually uh, in, in uh, computer science, they talk about this as a kind of curriculum method where you're kind of gradually changing the scope of problems that the, uh, the learner is being exposed to, and that's something else that you're And then just a little follow-up, uh, is this about potentially driven by environmental uh, values? So for instance, uh, your experiment where you had people lose two points, or I was going to lose two points, but you gain one point for everything else. In that case, search seems costly, but uh, exploitation seems beneficial, or yeah, better. Uh, if you had more options, and one of those options gave a whole lot of payout, would you anticipate seeing a lot of search behavior? Yeah, so this is an interesting question that comes from the Explore Exploit um, literature in like, reinforcement learning, where one interesting thing is that you can show that the horizon that you have makes a difference. So if you've got a lot of decisions ahead of you, then it makes sense to explore more because the information you've got from the exploration will help you for more decisions. Whereas if this is the only decision you're making, you're never going to play this game again, then you're better off exploiting. And there's some suggestion that part of the developmental story might be, of course, if you're a kid, you have much, a much longer horizon than you do if you're, um, if you're an adult. Um, but also things like, are you going to have to play this game again? What do you think the variety of games are that you're going to play? But in, in, the, in that literature, you can kind of have a very careful strategy about, OK, given that I've got this time class, and given that I've got this range of games, here's the best explore or exploit strategy. And I don't think the kids, there's, again, the evidence is kind of going back and forth. I'm not sure the kids are actually doing that. The kids may be just, you know, because they're kids, generating a lot of um, randomness. But that's one of the questions that is really out there for us. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to uh, the reference on sampling and the uh, yeah. Thank you. 
And the one question is maybe it's something like this curricular learning where you're manipulating the size of the space as the learner is going through it. That seems like a sort of plausible story about what both the individual kids might be doing and what human beings might be doing in the course of cultural evolution, for example, where we're, as a species, changing the space of uh, alternatives that we're considering based on the things that we, the things that we saw before. But that's the really difficult modeling um, problems. How, how, given the kinds of things that the kids are learning are these high, you know, so again, think about Augie and, uh, um, by the way, there's a sad story, which is that Augie is now seven, we still really in my view, but he was listening to the radio when I was talking about this on the radio, and he said, his dad said, oh, listen, that's Grandma talking about you all. And he turned to his dad and said, Daddy, I was only four. Like, really? I would never say something like that now. Uh, which is a little heartbreaking. Uh, but, uh, by the way, for those of you who are philosophers, I will tell one more Augie story. This is now Augie as a seven-year-old, and Georgie is his four-year-old little sister. Um, I was on the program Philosophy Talk, which I highly recommend. It's a wonderful radio program about philosophy. And I was, the slogan for Philosophy Talk, which I was telling the kids, was, we're the program that questions everything except your intelligence. What does that mean? That's great. What do you mean? What do you mean? I said, well, look, if you do philosophy, you can, you don't take anything from that. You can argue about anything. So like two plus two plus four, if you're doing philosophy, you could say, I don't know, maybe two plus two doesn't equal four. The only thing, this is normally rather than descriptive, is you can't say the other person is stupid. Uh, if you do philosophy, you have to assume the other person is smart, but they need a question. And obviously, just totally taking the this idea. I get it, I get it from I'm like, two, like, that's the word two, but maybe you don't really need two, maybe you really need one. And you say, make how you know that we need to make them, you put them together, and there's only one for five minutes. And then his little sister looking at him through this whole time, and then she, and looking at her hands, and she turns and says, Augie, two, two, four. <laughs> Yeah, so this is another one of the things that we 
thought about when we haven't done yet, which is if we manipulate affect, for example, so if we make them happier or you know less anxious or fearful, would that do it? Again, Liz Donowitz has a result of kids and not be able to maybe this would be able to, I have to check this, where inducing all actually seems to make them um, more exploratory. Um, and that's an interesting because all is an emotion that has this effect of narrowing the self and increasing the insignificance of the things that you're getting from the world that's all. So one of the things we thought is maybe, you know, if we could take, maybe our poor undergraduates are so chronically anxious that, um, which might very well be true at Berkeley, that, you know, they're just, even if we try to do a manipulation, they still think, is this going to be on the test or is this not going to be on the test? Uh, but we've thought about it as a way of the way that we can, we can change their, uh, we can change the degree of nurturing resources. And I kind of like that because it also, in some ways, is counterintuitive. So usually uh, what you say is, well, look, if things are more important, then you're going to do better. But this would be exactly the case where you think that that's kind of what the uh, the and the big result shows that when more hinges on your result, you're actually going to do worse than when you have a, a more, uh, when, when you, you, there's not as much reward from your decision. Uh, but we have a few studies. Yeah, but I think it's sort of the fact that you said before about the school system too, and maybe the fact that we're giving these kids more and more responsibilities is yeah. actually pushing them towards this, you know, exploit only state. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, have, I have thought about that, especially with our Berkeley undergraduates. Um, uh, no, I mean, I think he's right. What, what's happened is that we've, we've put the kids in a cultural context in which the kind of, and it's this kind of paradox of, our, of contemporary life that because education is really important for success, education becomes a kind of version of success. And we have very clear markers of things like what kind of grades we get, you know, our undergrads at Berkeley that were selected because they're the ones who got the, you know, 4.5 averages. Um, but almost by definition, if you've done that in high school, it means that you've been an you learned to exploit rather than to exploit. Uh, so I think I think there's there's this real paradox that we want people to be educated because we want them to have this wider range of options that they're going to consider be more exploratory. But in doing that, we end up actually narrowing the range of things that they can consider. And I think that's a tension lots of policy, um, you can see in lots of policy projects. Thank you. Yeah. So just think about how your exploration point versus exploitation works for language. I mean, I can oh, see yeah. working for phonetics phonology, you had a uh, pool and work for decided, but right. what about things that seem like the opposite, like a pool, we're working on a whole object assumption where yeah. kids have these very narrow things that helps them to learn. Yeah. And yeah, so that's a really interesting question. And for some of those things, actually, I can give a whole other talk. I should get some point about this. Uh, so um, here's an example. Um, yeah, so the learning relational versus individual concepts. That's a nice example where uh, that's an assumption that people have made for a long time is that kids are much better at learning with individual object names, for example, than they are. But it turns out that actually what you see with that is a kind of shaped curve, we don't work with that place, where the young kids who don't yet have a bias are actually open to more different options. And then they develop a particular, then they develop a particular bias, which is the way they treat um, what, what they do when they have ambiguous data. And the interesting thing is that whole literature about biases doesn't actually present the kids with any data. So in effect, what we're doing is seeing what their baseline is. So if, they, if there's no evidence to the contrary, assume a whole object assumption. And what people don't do is say, well, how about if you actually give the kids data that says this word actually is not encoding a whole object, it's encoding something else. And what will the code be like for their inferences in those cases? And, and people in syntax, for instance, have, and that's what the worker and, and cool kind of stuff suggests in phonology, which is you're starting out in this open space, then as you learn more, you narrow the range of options um, and I think that might very well turn out to be true in the most in the most cases. Um, but I don't know. I don't think that's about it. Yeah, Eric. Yeah, great talk, guys. Um, so I want to play devil's advocate because you mentioned how flexible children are in their right. and exploration, but they can also be incredibly rigid about some things like rules or yeah. what is my blanket or what is a blanket. Yeah. And so 
how do you, I guess one question is how do you balance? How does this, what's going on with flipping between these two things? Like, I can only drink out of the orange juice cup. Yeah, right. right? That is the only cup I drink out of. Right. It's like, oh, but anything could be a flipping. What is a flipping? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's, and of course, there's work about things like perseveration and things, but I think there's an interesting contrast, which is uh, kind of what philosophers would call a direction of fit contrast. So one thing is, what's the world actually like? And the other thing is, how am I going to regulate my actions? And in the regulating the actions part, that's where the, so if you look at something like the, uh, the Zolazo, you know, card sort test, tell the things, here's the thing that you have to do, then they often indeed are very rigid. So that's like, I'm only going to drink out the juice cup, I'm only going to pick the, you told me that it was a red one, so I'm only going to pick the red one, so I'm not going to shift. But that's really different from what's the structure of the world around me. So what's the, what it looks like. And I think you might see really different, we have a little bit of evidence about this, you might see really different results in those two. So we've actually done this with my birthday check, for instance, where we have a, you know, one condition, which is, here's the rule, here's how it works. It works this way. It works based on color. And now we're going to change the rule. Now it's going to work on, uh, on shade, as opposed to, here's this machine, and it, this one works on color. Now there's another one. We don't know how it works. Can you figure out how it works? So I think that's the, I think that's what we And by the way, it's interesting to think about something like perseveration as well, even in a non-rule-like context. Um, for instance, if you don't know whether something's deterministic or not, then actually doing things over and over again is not a stupid thing to do. So if you think that the world might be stochastic, which is a pretty good assumption if you're a kid, then actually doing the same thing over and over again is not, uh, you know, not useless. That's actually in, in a stochastic world, very often what you want to do is repeat an action on something to see what the other problem is. That's actually a rational question. And just uh, follow up, because I was really struck by the, the adolescents seem to be more flexible. Yeah. So, so what if like, there are domains that are more flexible and less flexible at different points of the yeah. based on what it is that you're exploring? That yeah, I think, that's, I think that's a very plausible hypothesis. So, um, the adolescents, so, so the example I like to give um, some examples I'd like to give this in the cultural evolution context is that uh, if you think about the way that kids are learning about, the two examples are kids learning about iPhones and kids learning about gay marriage. So if you think about my view of an iPhone compared to my you know, two old grandson's view, my view is that there's this basic principle, which is that iPhones work with keyboards because they're computers and everything works with keyboards, so I have to find the keyboard. And then there's like these extra gimmicks that they put on about you can talk to Siri or you can swipe, which I am kind of incapable of doing and just drive me crazy because uh, they do weird and unpredictable things. Uh, uh, my two year old grandson uh, thinks that the way you interact with computers is you talk to them or you swipe. He doesn't even, he's not literate yet, he doesn't even know how a keyboard works. He thinks a keyboard is like this weird thing that shows up randomly on the, on the iPhone. Um, so his theory is this much broader and actually more accurate uh, theory but with a very different kind of higher order abstract or hypothesis structure than, than mine is. The other example is if you look at think about gay marriage, you know, I'm a bisexual woman from Berkeley and I still think there's marriage and then gay marriage. Gay marriage is really good. It's a really good thing. It's just different from not gay marriage. And again, my four-year-old grandson thinks just doesn't get it, right? He thinks there's marriage and the way marriage works is sometimes you have a man or woman, sometimes you have two men and two women, just like that's not relevant to the category of whether something is marriage or not. And I think adolescents, that's a good example where adolescents are clearly the ones who have been at the cutting edge of big social change throughout history. That's where we might see the, those debates happening, whereas the younger kids, that's just not even the realm of things that they're thinking about. So yeah, I do, I do think it's, and you know, if you look at phonology, by the time you're nine months, you've already done the learning and narrative the language. And I think it's quite, and go back to that um, uh, brain chart, you can see that, um, you can see that, um, 
yeah, you can see that the auditory cortex, which is where language is going, has a different trajectory than the visual cortex, which has a different trajectory than the prefrontal cortex. So the visual cortex, by the time you won most of the low-level visual stuff, again, there's this phenomenon of having early plasticity and then later pruning, but for basic things like the way your visual system works, for things like convergence or perspective, that's done by the time you won, whereas for more conceptual things, it might not be done until for a game after one.
want, you want, you actually want the explorer exploit trade off. Really, is a trade off. You really want to be able to exploit. You want the people around you to be able to exploit because for one thing, if they don't, then all the those portals are going to die because there's going to be no one to feed them. Uh, so, so you, it, it is a genuine trade off, and I think one of the interesting things for adults is uh, a lot of the activities that engage in like science are about how you how you uh, do that training. So how do you, I was just talking about this, about you know, what's happened in science and what kind of incentive systems can we have so that we can get scientists who are able to do that kind of wide ranging exploration and play at the same time that, um, at the same time that they can get experiments done and get the grants and do all the things that they need to do to, to, uh, to get the right kinds of Get the resources for our graduate students. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time. We spend a lot of time dropping turnips in our graduate students' mouths. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, I think that's a really interesting. That's a really interesting question. Yeah. Uh, to touch on that last point, it seems possible because I think I mentioned this earlier that um, training might be a way to do some of yeah. these uh, activities that are uh, you know, perhaps. Also, rest of the play. Um, my question is um, more about uh, you mentioned the useful role of caregivers and integration in psychedelic experiences. Yeah. And I'm wondering, um, there, there have been a bunch of um, uh, studies showing how caregiving is one of the most impactful placebos. Um, and I'm wondering yeah. if the integration is usually associated with like understanding, communicating with the group or the, the caregiver. About the experience that she's having, um, if, if, if without necessarily connecting it to the caregiver, um, is there any clarity on what the role of integration is, the introspectively or just purposefully? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's just again, all of this is just anecdotal. You know, it's just starting out. People haven't tried to do systematic uh, experiments trying to see is it just that we're being taken care of, or is it something about actually being able to do some kind of and it is interesting that one of the things with uh, the phenology is that there's a little bit of evidence that you can do something like overcome the boundaries to the phenology better when someone's speaking boundaries to you than when they're just using regular language. And one of the effects, I mean, one of these is interesting because it both gives you information that's very relevant to the phonological structure of the language, and it also has this effect of making you feel happy and reassured and you know calm and all those kinds of things. And it's interesting to think about how these two things might actually be related to one another. I mean, one thing we know. So caregivers are providing this nurturing environment, but they're also doing things like providing data and information in particular ways that seem to be very well adjusted to the case learning capacities and how those things work out. Thank you.